Peter different than Judas? And I think that on the initial outset, we're like, well, there's some big differences uh, in how their lives turned out. But ultimately, uh, they're both apostles. They both uh, had an opportunity to encounter our Lord Jesus. But Peter is revered. We honor him as our first pope. We call him one of the faithful 11. So what makes him faithful in that? We see that Peter is uh, respected in the early church. He speaks uh, in the Council of Jerusalem. He stands at Pentecost and gives the first homily. But yet, if we look at his life up into those moments, we really see a rocky, and not the rock of Christ, but a rocky path to his papal seat. I, the reality is, he's an ordinary guy. He wasn't top in his class. He wasn't the smartest guy. He wasn't one of the selected scholars. He wasn't the richest. He wasn't the most put together. He makes a lot of mistakes and they're recorded in the book that's most commonly read in history. He smells like fish. <laughs> He's an ordinary guy. Even Jesus stands in front of him and says to him, Satan, he calls him Satan. I've done a lot of things in my life that I'm not proud of. But our Lord has never directly stood in front of me and said, Satan, get behind me. But really, in that moment, Peter was questioning. He didn't understand the suffering that Christ would have to undergo, why there had to be pain. And really, a lot of times, we question out of a good place. He wanted to protect Jesus, and Jesus said, no. You are thinking as man does, not as God does. Even on the night that Jesus is led ultimately to his crucifixion, that he is arrested, Peter denies him three times. He's missing on the road to Calvary. He isn't there at the foot of the cross. He abandons Jesus. But yet, again, we see Peter respect, have the respect of the early church. We see Jesus rename him, the name Peter means rock, entrusting to him the responsibility to be the vicar of Christ, to be Jesus' representation on earth. Why? What makes him different than Judas? Well, Judas gives into the idea that he's unlovable, that he's unforgivable. That what he's done cannot be redeemed or forgiven. He is shameful of his actions. He makes the mistake of Adam and Eve. When we look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 9, after Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit in the Garden of Eden, they had, God came and said, where are you? How do we hear God say that to us? Do we hear him say, where are you? Like, I'm going to yell at you. Or do we hear him say, where are you? I love you and I'm looking for you and I cannot find you. And to really think about how we picture God the Father sees us when we've done something against him. You know, it says that they hid. They were shame of their nakedness. And God is like, who told you this? Who told you that you were wrong? How have you experienced this pain and this suffering? Have you done what I said not to do? But instead of saying yes, Adam, in that moment, doesn't say, I'm sorry, please help me. He says, it's that woman's fault. I'm going to give some blame and I'm going to give some excuses and I'm just going to tiptoe out of this one. And like, God's like, can't you just say sorry? Can't you just ask for my help in this moment? God still loves them. 
He kills an animal. He fashions clothes for them. He makes them and protects them and tries to love them. He goes out on a rescue mission that will ultimately result in the death of his own son, the sacrifice of Jesus, to redeem them. So what can we learn? It's not the depth of our sin, or even the consistency. We can sin again and again and again and deny three times. That's not what divides us from God. It's not our questioning. It's not when we don't understand something. It's our unwillingness to repent, to say I'm sorry. Many potentially watching are preparing for their first confession, or you've already received the grace and the sacrament of confession, that we're offered the mercy from our Father who has adopted us and given us not a spirit of slavery or of fear, but a spirit of sonship. There's nothing we can do to lose the love of God or to earn the love of God. Our worth does not change because it is based in the dignity of being his son and daughter. So if we take a penny, pennies go through a lot, and they can get dropped on the ground and they can get really dirty. Their worth is still the same as the shiny brand new penny. Now, when you clean them off, they do look much prettier and they are much nicer, but their worth does not change. You are still loved. The love that God wants to give you is unconditional. He wants you to see that you are worth, no matter where you are right now and what you've done. But we need to sometimes sit and think about how our words, our actions, have hurt our relationship with Jesus and how they've hurt others. How we've hurt our siblings, our parents, our teachers, our friends. How maybe we've harbored a desire when we saw the gifts of Christmas to somebody else and we wanted those presents instead of being grateful for what we had. Maybe we've cheated or we've lied or we've taken something that isn't ours, even if it's just the candy that we didn't ask permission for our parents, that we snuck out. All of these things are what added up in Judas's life. And instead of coming back and saying, Lord, I've been stealing from the money pouch and I've really been greedy and it went so far that I went and asked for money to turn you over. Instead of doing that, he gives up. Because the reality is, is to say sorry is hard. It was so hard that he decided it was easier to quit living than to just go back and say sorry. So we are called to humbly admit that maybe we don't love with what's called the agape love. It's the self-sacrificing. So when Jesus turns back to Peter and says, do you love me? He says, do you love me with an agape love? And Peter's like, no, I love you with a brotherly love. Totally failed. And Jesus ends that saying, you will love me with an agape love. You will sacrifice your life for me. It's not today, you're not there yet. But through this path, we will learn together to get there. And so every day we get a chance to learn a little bit. We're never too far gone. Our sins are never too big or too small for God's forgiveness. He wants us to be a saint. He wants us to be in the garden in heaven with him forever. And one of the ways that we can do this is just examine our day. The reality is that we can sit and ask for God to enlighten what's happened over our day. We can give thanks for what has been good. We can review with the eyes of God what has happened. And then we can face our shortcomings, say I'm sorry, and then look forward to the next day where we meet God. And so looking at the opportunity when we're here in adoration tonight to say sorry to our Lord, to maybe take that home and say sorry to somebody that we need to in our family, and to sit there with the examine and just walk through our day with the Lord. It's called a nightly examine. And to give that opportunity, because if Judas had repented, he would be known as St. Judas the Repentant. Because God has that power. 
He wants to offer that level of forgiveness. And so tonight, let's accept it by saying that we're sorry. Thank you.